So, because, not because we want to make ourselves more miserable than we already are, but because we encounter them in practice, we want to generalize even NP problems into a larger problems, class of problems called NP hard problems. And they are problems that do not have to be even NP, right? They are not necessarily problems that uh, uh, you, you can solve if you had the right guess. And in fact, they don't even have to be a, uh, um, a decision problem at all. They can be optimization problems, but they are problems that uh, if you could have some magical device, some magic coprocessor, right, that solves that problem, then you can solve NP, all NP problems using in polynomial time using this oracle device, right? So what can our computers um, do, right? Uh, well, you see, that's the problem why um, I'm not proving here in class Cook's theorem that SAT is NP-complete because in order to prove that, you have to formalize the notion of computability. Because what does it mean, polynomial time algorithm? What kind of operations can an algorithm use? Right, for example, um, can an algorithm uh, use uh, uh, an oracle for Riemann hypothesis or something? Well, it turns out uh, that all programming languages uh, have uh, instructions that are chosen so that a computer with this programming language is a Turing complete. What does it mean that a problem is Turing, that a uh, program is uh, Turing complete and that a machine with such a program is Turing complete? It means that whatever is possible to compute at all, it can be computed by this machine. Notice, for example, when you need, uh, say, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you want to solve certain problem on your computer, you only go and buy the software, right, for this computer, uh, and the machine remains the same. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because uh, what's called a von Neumann uh, machine, uh, which is uh, what your computer essentially is, uh, modulo the fact that it has finite memory and similar, uh, is actually NP-complete, meaning it can solve any problem that is computable in principle, right? Now, assume that uh, um, you have uh, an additional functionality, an oracle, which somehow magically uh, returns an answer to a particular problem, right? Uh, then, uh, if such oracle allows you to solve all NP problems in polynomial time by using this quote-unquote coprocessor for this particular um, uh, problem, then uh, we say that uh, uh, the, this problem is NP hard. Why is it NP hard? Because if you had something that solves that problem, you can use that something to solve any NP problem in polynomial time. So we will see soon uh, examples. Um, the traveling optimization, traveling salesman problem in its optimization version is an example of an NP hard problem. What is traveling salesman optimization problem? Well, you are given a map with all cities and all the distances between any two cities, right? Uh, the problem is find a tour 
of all the cities that uh, is of minimal possible length. Notice this is not a decision problem. It's not yes, no problem. It's an optimization problem. But if we uh, had a coprocessor that uh, when you give it a graph, it can produce as, as, the, on, as the output um, a uh, optimal map, uh, sorry, optimal tour, uh, then clearly you can solve the traveling salesman decision problem. What is traveling salesman decision problem? It's the same story. You are given the map, but you are also given, <coughs> and you assume that all distances are, say, integers. And you are given an integer k, and the question is, is there a tour of all cities that visits every city once and whose length is smaller than k? So if you had optimization, uh, an oracle for the optimization problem, how would you solve the decision problem for traveling salesman? So you, you have uh, a device that when you enter your graph, it outputs a permutation of cities with the smallest possible distance. How would you use this to solve uh, the, the decision traveling salesman problem? Yes? Well, you could just iterate through the list, add up the distances, and then see if the total is less than k. Exactly. So you simply take the proposed tour, you simply compute all the distances, and you see whether this is smaller or equal to k, right? Because there would be a uh, path of land at most k, just in case the minimal land path is uh, of land smaller than k. But notice the optimization problem is not at all a decision problem. But we will see that actually uh, optimization and uh, uh, decision problems are not, uh, the optimization problem is not much harder than the decision problem of the same kind. We will see that later. Okay, so this is... Um, um, ba -ba -bum. So this is how you would reduce the optimization problem, sorry, the decision problem to optimization problem. Uh, so this is why we want to find a way to um, determine whether your problem, so it's not important just to know whether a problem is uh, uh, NP complete, because that refers only to decision problems. Most of the problems that computer scientists deal with are actually optimization problems. So the question is now, what do you do when you uh, encounter an NP-hard problem, right? So, for example, again, you have your traveling salesman optimization problem, but you know there is no chance to solve it in polynomial time. What you can try to do, though, is to solve, to find an algorithm that will perhaps not produce the shortest path, but will produce a path that is not much longer than the shortest path. And what you might be able to hope for, for example, is to find a path that is not longer than twice the, the shortest path. And there is a whole field in computer science that is called approximation algorithms that does precisely that. For problems that are NP-hard, usually optimization problems that are NP-hard, they offer various algorithms that uh, uh, solve the problem approximately, right? Because if you are given, you know, if you are a mailman, you cannot say your boss, I'm not delivering the mail because I don't know what path to take, right? But it would be nice 
if you don't know what path to take, if you have an algorithm that will guarantee you that you will not walk more than twice the minimal possible distance, right? Now, we will see whether this can be done, but just a word of caution, right? Sometimes very similarly sounding problems uh, can be fundamentally of different complexity. So, for example, if you are given a graph and two vertices, then answering the question if there is a path from S to T of land at most K is just the shortest path question, and we know it's solvable in P, right? However, if you are given a graph and you have to answer the question uh, if given two vertices, there exists a path that is non-self-intersecting, right? Simple path of length at least k, so rather than smaller than k, uh, at most k, uh, you want to find a path of length at least k. Well, good luck because this is an NP-complete problem, so you cannot solve it in polynomial time. Um, so, um, another example is if you are given a propositional formula in conjunctive normal form. We just mentioned that if you limit that each clause has a three, at most three uh, variables or negated variables, three literals, this is intractable NP-hard problem, NP-complete problem. However, if you limit that each clause can have at most two literals, this problem is solvable in P time and try to do it as a homework. Try to solve, find a decision procedure which when you are given a uh, uh, a formula so that each conjunct has at most two letters, right? Show that uh, you can determine if it's possible to satisfy this formula in polynomial time. And as a hint, try to reduce it to a question of in graph theory. Uh, take the vertices of the graph to be uh, to correspond to propositional letters and maybe another set of vertices to correspond to negation of uh, propositional letters and then see when would you connect, uh, uh, say, P with uh, not Q, right? Uh, because remember, everything is representable using disjunction and negation. In fact, you can reduce it even to an implication. So think about that. And finally, uh, if you are given a graph, answering the question if there exists an Euler tour along the graph, which means a tour that it might visit every vertex several times, but it traverses every edge exactly once and returns to the starting point. This is solvable in polynomial time but as we mentioned, uh, the question, when you are given a graph, uh, whether there exists a tour that uh, uh, visits every vertex exactly once is NP-hard. So similarly sounding problems can be vastly different. And this is adding the confusion because Sometimes you might make a mistake believing that something is NP-complete when it's not and vice versa, simply because they can be so close to each other in uh, formulation. So the first example of an NP-complete problem was the Cook theorem that says that every NP problem is reducible to SAT. And the proof is not terribly complicated. Um, I am going to show it tomorrow in the extended class, and you can watch 
watch it on the, on YouTube. Uh, it's a it's not terribly hard, but it's very clever uh, construction. But um, I mentioned that uh, you would want to prove uh, uh, that your problem at hand is NP-complete. You don't have to employ Cook's ingenuity. What you would do, how do we prove that a, a problem is NP-complete? Well, we rely on the following theorem that says, uh, if you have an NP-complete, so NP-complete uh, problem V, right? Or oh, let's, well, okay, V. And if you manage to show uh, that uh, V, problem V is polynomial time reducible to your problem U. So notice, you are not reducing problem U to an NP-complete problem, but the other direction. You are reducing NP-complete problem to a problem that you suspect that is NP-complete. If you manage to reduce an NP-complete problem to U, you must be also NP-complete. Why is this so? How would you prove that U is also NP-complete? What you have to show is if you take any other NP-complete problem, you have to show that it's reducible to that problem. How would you do that? Exactly. So first, because U is, sorry, V is NP-complete, you can reduce by a mapping G um, your arbitrary problem X to problem V. But then you manage to reduce problem V to problem U. And then the composition of these two mappings, we have to show that it's P time computable, will produce a re reduction of X to U and would verify that U is NP complete. Now, why is a composition of two polynomial time computable um, functions also polynomial time computable? Well, clearly it's a reduction, right? Because we know that uh, this is, G is a reduction, so it maps false instances into false instances and true instances into true instances and similar here, so the composition will map false into false and true into true. But we have to show that the composition is P time computable. What does this mean? Uh, we have to show that the total computation of the composition runs in polynomial time. Well, G is polynomial time, so computing the image of uh, x under g will take some polynomial in length of x many steps. Now the trick is, because g is polynomial in the length of x, the size of g of x, uh, namely the length of g of x, is at most a polynomial, in fact this polynomial p of x, in the size of x. Because if something runs in polynomial time of the input, even if it kept all just writing once, 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 if it runs only p of x many steps, it cannot produce more than p of x many symbols. And now you know that f is p time, so uh, we know that the runtime t of f applied to g of x, right, is smaller than a polynomial in the length of, uh, uh, of the input, which is here, g of x. But g of x, this size, as we saw, is polynomial in length of x, so if you substitute a polynomial inside another polynomial, 
you get a polynomial of um, degree that is, uh, uh, what is the degree if you substitute one polynomial in the other, it's at most uh, the product of the powers, right? So this shows that the composition is also polynomial time. Okay, so in order to, um, you can see on the slides exactly the details, uh, in order to show that problem in hand is P time complete, all what you have to do is you have to reduce a known P time complete problem to your problem. And this can be done uh, with clever constructions. And again, this will, you might ask, how am I supposed to come up with something so clever? As I say, uh, there are patterns of the proof, maybe hundreds of them, but most of the tricks are already invented and in this book that I mentioned. So you can simply look for a similar problem and tweak the construction from the book Computers and Intractability. So let us reduce three sat, okay, three sat to VC. We showed that uh, in fact sat is reducible to three sat. We showed how any sat problem can be reduced to an instance of three sat where every conjunct has at most three terms. So we now want to show that three sat is reducible to vertex cover, uh, which will then imply that vertex cover is also NP complete. And this is the trick. So let me just put it on the screen because we need this picture. Okay, this is what you do. So your formula, each conjunct has three propositional letters or negated propositional letters. For each conjunct, construct a triangle, just like this, right? Here we have three uh, conjuncts, so we have three triangles. If we had four conjuncts, we will have four triangles, okay? then count how many propositional letters are involved. And for each propositional letter, make a segment and label uh, one end with that letter, the other end with negation of that letter, okay? And then do the following. For each clause, connect the vertices in any order of the corresponding triangle with the letter or negated letter that occurs in that formula. So here, first one is P1 or not P2 or P3. So P1, this vertex is connected to P1. This vertex is connected to not P2. And this <coughs> vertex is connected to P3 because this is what appears in the first conjunct. <coughs> Excuse me. So next, uh, for example, for C2, uh, one e end of the triangle is connected to not P1 because not P1 is here. Then another end is connected to P2 because P2 is here. And the third end is third vertex is connected to P3. And similarly for C3, it's connected to not P1, to P2, and not P3. So that's a legitimate graph. The claim now is, <clears throat> if we count the number of clauses, okay, if we count the number of clauses, multiply them by by two and add the number of variables, right? So we now consider a number that is equal to 2m because m is the number of clauses plus n is the number of variables. Then the claim is the original 3SAT formula has a satisfying assignment 
If and only if this graph produced in this way contains a vertex cover of size at most 2m plus n, right? This is original um, Karp's construction from this famous paper that gave 21 NP complete problems. And before we prove that, I cannot help it but make a observation. Karp published a paper with 21 reductions to famous um, uh, NP problems. If this happened today, Karp would have published 21 papers each with one reduction, right? Because his bosses count how many papers you publish, and so you have to jump through the hoops, so the time slightly changed, right? Uh, and it, it didn't seem that previous arrangement in academia when people didn't count how many pa papers you publish uh, hurt science very much. In fact, last century we had developed quantum mechanics. We developed relativity theory. We developed genetics, right? In this century we have Facebook and we have Twitter. Right? But, uh, you know, <coughs> executives know much better than myself, I'm sure. So, um, let us now show that, uh, in fact, this graph has a vertex cover. If and only if the original formula had a satisfying assignment. Well, let's see. <coughs> This vertex cover has to have at most 2m plus n many vertices. For each triangle, in order to have a vertex cover, you have to cover at least two vertices, right? If you cover only one vertex, you will have an edge with no, right? If I cover only this vertex, then I'll have this edge that has both ends uncovered. So, if something is a vertex cover, it has to cover two vertices of each triangle, but there are m many triangles. In total, you will have to cover two m many vertices, right? Then we look at these segments, right? At these segments, uh, of course, each segment has to have at least one vertex covered. But there are n many segments because this is how many variables you have. And you have to cover n vertices. But your total limit is precisely 2m plus n. This means that no triangle can have all three vertices covered. Right? Because even if you cover in every triangle only two vertices and only one edge of each segment, you are out of the budget of how many points you can cover. So every triangle has at least one edge uncovered. But if something is a, um, if something is a vertex cover, then each of these lines has to have at least one end covered. But if this end is uncovered, then the other end must be covered. So, if there was a vertex cover for this uh, graph, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a letter true if it was covered, and I'm going to put a letter false if uh, the negation was covered. So now the trick is that each clause will have one edge, sorry, one vertex uncovered, which means that the other end must be covered, and then this letter will force this clause to be true. Right? Um, so did you, do you follow this? It's a little bit tricky, right? So we first figure out that if something is a vertex cover, every triangle has 
exactly two vertices covered. Look at an uncovered vertex. It's connected to one end of these segments. And if it's vertex covered, this end must be covered. But we said we are putting uh, the variable if it's covered to true, if it's a, a, a negated variable is covered, we make it false. So negated variable will be false. And this link exists only if not P2 exists in this uh, disjunction. And so always uncovered end of these edges will guarantee the existence of a letter, covered letter that will, covered literal, that will guarantee the truth of the formula. Um, and in other direction, it's kind of similar, maybe even a bit easier. So if you have an assignment, if your letter is set to true, uh, you will cover that letter. If it's set to false, then you will cover uh, the negation uh, of the letter, right? Um, and then there will be a satisfying assignment if each triangle is connected at least with one uh, covered uh, letter, so uh, covered literal. So you can read the details uh, um, to the um, through these slides. So it's not a rocket science, but obviously it's a very clever uh, construction. Yeah, here it is uh, uh, how you um, given an assignment, how you cover the vertices. Okay, so. Um, what we said is that if an optimization problem is NP hard, we do not try to solve it exactly, but instead we try to find a feasible solution that is not too bad. And lo and behold, we are now going to show that vertex co cover is a tame problem because it allows a two approximation. Namely, we will show that uh, even though we don't know how to find a minimal size uh, vertex cover, we can always easily find a cover that has at most twice the number of vertices of the minimal one. And the construction is very pretty because it's a little bit counterintuitive. You see, it is very tempting to choose, so which vertex would you choose to cover? You have a graph. The most connected one. But guess what? It's easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's possible to make counterexample when if you cover the most connected one with the largest index right vertex, you remove the, all of the uh, adjacent vertices, and you keep doing that, you don't get uh, the solution. What you do is totally counterintuitive, and you do it as follows. You pick an arbitrary edge, and you cover both ends. This is what's counterintuitive, because when it comes to this edge, obviously, one covering is redundant, right? But it allows the... Then what you do you remove all the edges and adjacent vertices that are connected to either of the ends. And you are then left with one edge that is isolated and both ends covered, plus the remainder of your graph. Then you pick another arbitrary edge, cover both vertices, remove all um, adjacent edges and the other ends, and you keep doing that for as long as you have uncovered, as you have uh, vertices. <coughs> Sorry, uh, you, so at each stage of construction, you either have edges that both ends are covered, 
or no ends are covered because at each stage whenever you have one end covered you remove these edges. Now the claim is that uh, uh, this must be a vertex cover. It must be a vertex cover because all the edges in order to remove an edge at least one of the, actually exactly one of the ends must have been covered, right? And clearly all the remaining edges have both ends covered, so it's a vertex cover. But the size of this vertex cover is at most twice the minimal size cover. Why is that so? How many uh, points have, do we have covered? It's exactly the number of remaining edges multiplied by two, right? So why is it the case that the minimal vertex cover can contain uh, at least half that many vertices? What do you think? So what's a vertex cover? A vertex cover is a subset so that every edge has at least one end in that set, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Among the edges that are left, can they share vertices? Well, let's see. They cannot share vertices because at each stage of construction, I remove all the edges that are connected to either of these two edges. So after I terminate, I'll have edges with disjoint ends. But if something is a vertex cover, it has to contain at least one vertex of each of these disjoint edges. So the total number of points must be at least equal to the number of disjoint edges. But our vertex cover has precisely twice the number of disjoint edges. So because every vertex cover has to have at least one point of all of these disjoint edges, it cannot have less than half of our vertex cover. Right? So that's uh, an example of... Uh, of an approximation algorithm. Okay, I am kind of worried that you are so quiet, so I don't want to overwhelm you. Let's stop here. We are almost through with, uh, please uh, read this at home. We are going to finish it tomorrow. This is important thing for every computer scientist to know, trust me.